Chapter fourteen part one of the Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The sun of that same day going down, dusk was saluted as usual at the hotel by an instantaneous sparkle of electric lights. The hours between dinner and bedtime were always difficult enough to kill and the night after the dance they were further tarnished by the peevishness of dissipation. Certainly, in the opinion of Hurst and Hewitt, who lay back in long armchairs in the middle of the hall, with their coffee cups beside them, and their cigarettes in their hands, the evening was unusually dull, the women unusually badly dressed, the men unusually fatuous, moreover when the mail had been distributed half an hour ago there were no letters for either of the two young men as every other person practically had received two or three plump letters from england which they were now engaged in reading this seemed hard and prompted hurst to make the caustic remark that the animals had been fed their silence he said reminded him of the silence in the lion house when each beast holds a lump of raw meat in its paws. He went on, stimulated by this comparison, to liken some to hippopotamuses, some to canary-birds, some to swine, some to parrots, and some to loathsome reptiles curled round the half-decayed bodies of sheep. The intermittent sounds, now a cough, now a horrible wheezing or throat-clearing, now a little patter of conversation were just he declared what you hear if you stand in the lion house when the bones are being mauled but these comparisons did not rouse hewitt who after a careless glance round the room fixed his eyes upon a thicket of native spears which were so ingeniously arranged as to run their points at you whichever way you approached them he was clearly oblivious of his surroundings, whereupon Hurst, perceiving that Hewitt's mind was a complete blank, fixed his attention more closely upon his fellow-creatures. He was too far from them, however, to hear what they were saying, but it pleased him to construct little theories about them from their gestures and appearance. Mrs. Thornbury had received a great many letters she was completely engrossed in them when she had finished a page she handed it to her husband or gave him the sense of what she was reading in a series of short quotations linked together by a sound at the back of her throat evie writes that george has gone to glasgow he finds mr chadbourne so nice to work with and we hope to spend christmas together but I should not like to move Betty and Alfred any great distance. No, quite right. Though it is difficult to imagine cold weather in this heat. Eleanor and Roger drove over in the new trap. Eleanor certainly looked more like herself than I've seen her since the winter. She has put baby on three bottles now, which I'm sure is wise. I'm sure it is, too and so gets better nights my hair still falls out i find it on the pillow but i am cheered by hearing from totty hall green muriel is in torquay enjoying herself greatly at dances she is going to show her black pug after all a line from herbert so busy poor fellow ah margaret says Poor old Mrs. Fairbanks died on the 8th, quite suddenly in the conservatory, only a maid in the house who hadn't the presence of mind to lift her up, which they think might have saved her, but the doctor says it might have come at any moment, and one can only feel thankful that it was in the house and not in the street. I should think so the pigeons have increased terribly just as the rabbits did five years ago 
while she read her husband kept nodding his head very slightly but very steadily in sign of approval near by miss allen was reading her letters too they were not altogether pleasant as could be seen from the slight rigidity which came over her large fine face as she finished reading them and replaced them neatly in their envelopes the lines of care and responsibility on her face made her resemble an elderly man rather than a woman the letters brought her news of the failure of last year's fruit crop in new zealand which was a serious matter for hubert her only brother made his living on a fruit farm and if it failed again of course he would throw up his place come back to england and what were they to do with him this time the journey out here which meant the loss of a term's work became an extravagance and not the just and wonderful holiday due to her after fifteen years of punctual lecturing and correcting essays upon english literature emily her sister who was a teacher also wrote we ought to be prepared though i have no doubt hubert will be more reasonable this time and then went on in her sensible way to say that she was enjoying a very jolly time in the lakes they are looking exceedingly pretty just now i have seldom seen the trees so forward at this time of year we have taken our lunch out several days old alice is as young as ever and asks after every one affectionately the days pass very quickly and term will soon be here political prospects not good i think privately but do not like to damp ellen's enthusiasm lloyd george has taken the bill up but so have many before now and we are where we are but trust to find myself mistaken anyhow we have our work cut out for us surely meredith lacks the human note one likes in w w she concluded and went on to discuss some questions of english literature which miss allen had raised in her last letter at a little distance from miss allen on a seat shaded and made semi-private by a thick clump of palm trees arthur and susan were reading each other's letters the big slashing manuscripts of hockey-playing young women in wiltshire lay on arthur's knee while susan deciphered tight little legal hands which rarely filled more than a page and always conveyed the same impression of jocular and breezy good will i do hope mr hutchinson will like me arthur she said looking up who's your loving flo asked arthur flo graves the girl i told you about who was engaged to that dreadful mr vincent said susan is mr hutchinson married she asked already her mind was busy with benevolent plans for her friends or rather with one magnificent plan which was simple too they were all to get married at once directly she got back marriage marriage that was the right thing the only thing the solution required by every one she knew and a great part of her meditations was spent in tracing every instance of discomfort loneliness ill-health unsatisfied ambition restlessness eccentricity taking things up and dropping them again public speaking and philanthropic activity on the part of men and particularly on the part of women to the fact that they wanted to marry were trying to marry and had not succeeded in getting married if as she was bound to own these symptoms sometimes persisted after marriage she could only ascribe them to the unhappy law of nature which decreed that there was only one arthur venning and only one susan who could marry him 
her theory of course had the merit of being fully supported by her own case she had been vaguely uncomfortable at home for two or three years now and a voyage like this with her selfish old aunt who paid her fare but treated her as servant and companion in one was typical of the kind of thing people expected of her directly she became engaged mrs paley behaved with instinctive respect positively protested when susan as usual knelt down to lace her shoes and appeared really grateful for an hour of susan's company where she had been used to exact two or three as her right she therefore foresaw a life of far greater comfort than she had been used to and the change had already produced a great increase of warmth in her feelings towards other people it was close on twenty years now since mrs paley had been able to lace her own shoes or even to see them the disappearance of her feet having coincided more or less accurately with the death of her husband a man of business soon after which event mrs paley began to grow stout she was a selfish independent old woman possessed of a considerable income which she spent upon the upkeep of a house that needed seven servants and a charwoman in lancaster gate and another with a garden and carriage horses in surrey susan's engagement relieved her of the one great anxiety of her life that her son christopher should entangle himself with his cousin now that this familiar source of interest was removed she felt a little low and inclined to see more in susan than she used to she had decided to give her a very handsome wedding present a check for two hundred two hundred and fifty or possibly conceivably it depended upon the under gardener and huff's bill for doing up the drawing-room three hundred pounds sterling she was thinking of this very question revolving the figures as she sat in her wheeled chair with a table spread with cards by her side the patients had somehow got into a muddle and she did not like to call for susan to help her as susan seemed to be busy with arthur she's every right to expect a handsome present from me of course she thought looking vaguely at the leopard on its hind legs and i've no doubt she does money goes a long way with every one the young are very selfish if i were to die nobody would miss me but dakins and she'll be consoled by the will however i've got no reason to complain i can still enjoy myself i'm not a burden to any one i like a great many things a good deal in spite of my legs being slightly depressed however she went on to think of the only people she had known who had not seemed to her at all selfish or fond of money who had seemed to her somehow rather finer than the general run people she willingly acknowledged who were finer than she was there were only two of them one was her brother who had been drowned before her eyes the other was a girl her greatest friend who had died in giving birth to her first child these things had happened some fifty years ago they ought not to have died she thought however they did and we selfish old creatures go on the tears came to her eyes she felt a genuine regret for them a kind of respect for their youth and beauty and a kind of shame for herself but the tears did not fall and she opened one of those innumerable novels which she used to pronounce good or bad or pretty middling or really wonderful i can't think how people come to imagine such things she would say taking off her spectacles and looking up 
with the old faded eyes that were becoming ringed with white. Just behind the stuffed leopard Mr. Elliot was playing chess with Mr. Pepper. He was being defeated, naturally, for Mr. Pepper scarcely took his eyes off the board, and Mr. Elliot kept leaning back in his chair and throwing out remarks to a gentleman who had only arrived the night before. A tall, handsome man with a head resembling the head of an intellectual ram. After a few remarks of a general nature had passed, they were discovering that they knew some of the same people, as indeed had been obvious from their appearance directly they saw each other. Ah, yes, old true fit, said Mr. Elliot. He has a son at Oxford. I've often stayed with them. It's a lovely old Jacobean house. Some exquisite groses. One or two Dutch pictures which the old boy kept in the cellars. Then there were stacks upon stacks of prints. Oh, the dirt in that house. He was a miser, you know. The boy married a daughter of Lord Pinwell's. I know them, too. The collecting mania tends to run in families. This chap collects buckles. Men's shoe buckles, they must be. In use between the years 1580 and 1660. The dates mayn't be right, but facts, as I say. Your true collector always has some unaccountable fad of that kind. On other points he's as level-headed as a breeder of shorthorns, which is what he happens to be. Then the Pinwells, as you probably know, have their share of eccentricity, too. Lady Maud, for instance. He was interrupted here by the necessity of considering his move. Lady Maud has a horror of cats and clergymen and people with big front teeth. I've heard her shout across a table, Keep your mouth shut, Miss Smith. They're as yellow as carrots. Across a table, mind you. To me she's always been civility itself. She dabbles in literature, likes to collect a few of us in her drawing room. But mention a clergyman, a bishop even, nay, the archbishop himself, and she gobbles like a turkey cock. I've been told it's a family feud, something to do with an ancestor in the reign of Charles I. Yes, he continued, suffering check after check. I always like to know something of the grandmothers of our fashionable young men. In my opinion, they preserve all that we admire in the eighteenth century, with the advantage, in the majority of cases, that they are personally clean. Not that one would insult old Lady Barbara by calling her clean. How often do you think, Hilda? He called out to his wife. Her ladyship takes a bath. I should hardly like to say, Hugh, Mrs. Elliot tittered. But wearing puce velvet, as she does even on the hottest August day, it somehow doesn't show. Pepper, you have me said Mr. Elliot. My chess is even worse than I remembered. He accepted his defeat with great equanimity, because he really wished to talk. He drew his chair back beside Mr. Wilfred Flushing, the newcomer. Are these at all in your line? he asked, pointing at a case in front of them, where highly polished crosses, jewels, and a bit of embroidery the work of the natives, were displayed to tempt visitors. Shams, all of them, said Mr. Flushing briefly. This rug now isn't at all bad. He stopped and picked up a piece of the rug at their feet. Not old, of course, but the design is quite in the right tradition. Alice, lend me your brooch. See the difference between the old work and the new? A lady who was reading with great concentration 
unfastened her brooch and gave it to her husband without looking at him or acknowledging the tentative bow which mr elliot was desirous of giving her if she had listened she might have been amused by the reference to old lady barborough her great-aunt but oblivious of her surroundings she went on reading the clock which had been wheezing for some minutes like an old man preparing to cough now struck nine the sound slightly disturbed certain somnolent merchants government officials and men of independent means who were lying back in their chairs chatting smoking ruminating about their affairs with their eyes half shut they raised their lids for an instant at the sound and then closed them again they had the appearance of crocodiles so fully gorged by their last meal that the future of the world gives them no anxiety whatever the only disturbance in the placid bright room was caused by a large moth which shot from light to light whizzing over elaborate heads of hair and causing several young women to raise their hands nervously and exclaim some one ought to kill it absorbed in their own thoughts hewitt and hurst had not spoken for a long time when the clock struck hurst said ah the creatures begin to stir he watched them raise themselves look about them and settle down again what i abhor most of all he concluded is the female breast imagine being venning and having to get into bed with susan but the really repulsive thing is that they feel nothing at all about what i do when i have a hot bath they're gross they're absurd they're utterly intolerable so saying and drawing no reply from hewitt he proceeded to think about himself about science about cambridge about the bar about helen and what she thought of him until being very tired he was nodding off to sleep suddenly hewitt woke him up how do you know what you feel hurst are you in love asked hurst he put in his eyeglass don't be a fool said hewitt well i'll sit down and think about it said hurst one really ought to if these people would only think about things the world would be a far better place for us all to live in are you trying to think that was exactly what hewitt had been doing for the last half hour but he did not find hurst sympathetic at the moment i shall go for a walk he said remember we weren't in bed last night said hurst with a prodigious yawn hewitt rose and stretched himself i want to go and get a breath of air he said an unusual feeling had been bothering him all the evening and forbidding him to settle into any one train of thought it was precisely as if he had been in the middle of a talk which interested him profoundly when some one came up and interrupted him he could not finish the talk and the longer he sat there the more he wanted to finish it as the talk that had been interrupted was a talk with rachel he had to ask himself why he felt this and why he wanted to go on talking to her hurst would merely say that he was in love with her but he was not in love with her did love begin in that way with the wish to go on talking no it always began in his case with definite physical sensations and these were now absent he did not even find her physically attractive there was something of course unusual about her she was young inexperienced and inquisitive they had been more open with each other than was usually possible he always found girls interesting to talk to 
and surely these were good reasons why he should wish to go on talking to her and last night what with the crowd and the confusion he had only been able to begin to talk to her what was she doing now lying on a sofa and looking at the ceiling perhaps he could imagine her doing that and helen in an armchair with her hands on the arm of it so looking ahead of her with her great big eyes oh no they'd be talking of course about the dance but suppose rachel was going away in a day or two suppose this was the end of her visit and her father had arrived in one of the steamers anchored in the bay it was intolerable to know so little therefore he exclaimed how do you know what you feel hurst to stop himself from thinking end of chapter fourteen part one